the main roles um, in folks showing up here today as one of the um, main drivers of impact and, and how uh, we might be able to turn the tide on, on uh, these cancer disparities um, and, and kind of the, the rising incidence um, in these new cases amongst um, our community. Uh, what do you, you think, and, and I'll pose this to the entirety of our panel here, what do you think are, are some of the most important steps we can take uh, to further reduce disparities um, in cancer care, thinking about the broad array of factors, right, the numerous reasons why there are inequities? Does anybody else want to take that first? So it's, 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 a, it's a tough question, um, and it's a complex one. <laughs> There's a lot that factors into the disparity. I think for the sake of this discussion, I'll, I'll try to keep as best as possible uh, the socioeconomic issues out of the out of the discussion. Unfortunately, it's deeply intertwined with some of the issues in terms of the actual direct care. Um, so the one example of that that really would be hard uh, or less intertwined with the, with the socioeconomic factors would be uh, in clinical cancer research drug research, uh, clinical trials, um, African-American representation is oftentimes very poor. And it's actually, this is studied as well. It's actually scientifically proven to be very poor. Um, and a lot of that has to do with access to the research centers. Um, even, so, you know, I came from MD Anderson in Houston, and even at a, in a center like that, that's actually located pretty close to uh, you know, the, the, the black community, you don't see very often black patients enrolled in clinical trials uh, or really in general. Um, and a lot of that has to do, unfortunately, again, with uh, some of the socioeconomic issues and the fact that business uh, medicine has become uh, uh, more of a business. But there are efforts, uh, I think, that we could do better um, as, as scientists and clinicians to bring up that representation uh, such that the treatments that we're recommending we also no work in the African-American community. Because if you have a clinical trial and you're basing all of your decision making and whether the drug works uh, on, you know, 2,000 uh, Hispanic and white people, and, um, you know, there's a chance that that drug may not work as well, right, in the, in the African community. And we, we know that based on the genetics that Franz alluded to, uh, that certain cancers behave differently in black folks. and um, we're not sure why entirely. Uh, we have identified some things that could be directly linked to certain genes, but for the most part, um, we, we just haven't studied it that well because uh, you know, African Americans haven't been represented. And so I think that's something that you know, we could do a better job of. Um, and you know, looking at places like Texas Tech, stepping into that arena, uh, UTEP, uh, really using that, that federal grant money to to try to involve the community a little bit more, I think. And then oftentimes, Dr. Solomon was mentioned clinical trials, and usually the representation of, from African Americans is about 3%. So when we are talking about getting more of the community into clinical trials, I, as a healthcare professional, know that we have to re-earn trust. I know there's been a lot of tru uh, trust issues when it comes to clinical trials. So I think it's a really a big part of what we need to do is to get out there and make you trust so that, so that you're more willing to, to enroll in these, to be a part of these. Yes, we also need to expose as, as healthcare workers because you may never hear about them. So we need to bring them up, but I also think we owe it to gr earn trust back. of those uh, statements. I would also add that we also have to get comfortable about talking about these things, right? Um, being the booty doc, it's very uncomfortable to even think about the things that I deal with. And so if you ever came over to my house, we talked about poop and eating fiber every day like it's a uh, regular talk. So I think when you make these things more of a normal situation and more uh, normal discussions, then that will then bring along the research grants and all the, the funding and things like that that can come along with that. But um, in my clinics, it's very relaxed. There's a lot of joking. I mean, 
five minutes into this talk and we're joking. And so that's kind of my way of getting this kind of discussion and access to folks that, you know, don't usually like to talk about these things, you know, and not just colon cancers, but any kind of cancer. People are scared. People are, you know, they have family members that went through bad things. They don't want to talk about it. And so that's where you have to get very comfortable with this kind of, you know, um, situation. I want to um, kind of focus and, and, and focus on this word of representation. We've spoken about it in clinical trials. How much does representation, when we're talking about the clinician, right, whether it's the nurse or the physician um, or the radiation oncologist, um, how much do you think that plays into um, the care of the community where that community member might be able to see themselves um, in, in the face of the cl clinician? Oh, I think that's, that's huge. Um, and I don't see many black folks in my clinic um, just because there's not that many, but when you do see a black patient that comes into my clinic, the, their eyes blow up and they just are so more welcoming and, and they seem more willing to tell me things. Um, and, and I think that's wonderful. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of black doctors or brown doctors, and so they don't see that very much. And so I take that, um, you know, I, 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 I hold that very dear to my heart when the patients, you know, put that kind of trust in me just by seeing me. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, we just have to work on getting more brown folks into medicine. And that's a whole nother panel we can have, I think, but I think it is a, a very important aspect of medicine. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%. <clears throat> Something I'll add on to that is, and, uh, you know, I, I, I can only speak to the physician side. Dr. Walker went to medical school, too. And, you know, you can look around at your class when you're there and just get a sense of how many folks understand the culture um, and how many folks um, can tie, uh, you know, we talked about some things in terms of uh, discussing health and how often uh, health is really discussed in black culture compared to other cultures. It really isn't comparatively, uh, you know, compared to other cultures, a focus per se. And, you know, having that background and understanding a little bit more of where your patient's coming from, um, I think makes a huge difference in terms of being able to get them what they need and understand where, where what they might be struggling with and, and what may be a problem, right? Um, and you see it all the time. I mean, I see it in, in my clinic um, where there's just a disconnect, right? They, they, there's just a lot of doctors don't have an understanding, you know, whether it's they're, you know, born with a silver spoon or, or they're from a completely different, uh, not very diverse community. Um, sometimes they'll just make, you know, in their mind, the recommendations they're making are just very clear cut. And like, you just need to do this and you'll be fine. But the patient may be coming from somewhere completely different. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's really important. How to fix it, though, is, is much <laughs> dicier. That's why we're here. <laughs> Lean on the Lord. Um, there's something that you said that I, I want to uh, kind of lean into here, um, where a, a patient sees you, and uh, right there's that, you know, in, in the literature they call it cultural concordance, right? They, they see you, and they, they kind of open up, uh, spill their guts. They're, they're willing to tell you things they might not tell another physician that doesn't look like them or, or share that, that same uh, cultural understanding. Um, and, and it harkens back to, you know, when we heard uh, uh, Chad, Chadwick Bozeman passed away, and no one knew, like, I can't believe King T'Challa had cancer. No one knew, all right? Um, and what does that uh, kind of tell us where uh, there are folks in our community who are, are, are secretly or, or kind of uh, suffering in silence? Um, and I think when it comes to diagnoses like cancer, that in any community you get a diagnosis like that, it's scary. Um, but oftentimes scary might mean secretive and folks might uh, keep that from their own families. How do you um, kind of sift through, work through that as a, as a clinician um, 
and kind of open those doors uh, for, for patients? Yeah, I think it does come back to though being comfortable talking about it, right? So again, I talk about it a lot with my family, my friends, everybody knows that they can come talk to me about poop and going to the bathroom and what's this blood in my toilet kind of thing. My whole block on the, in, the, in the neighborhood knows it. I mean, it's just something that I'm very comfortable talking about. And so when a minority patient comes into my clinic and I just start rattling off, hey, what do you do in the bathroom? Let's, then it's real laid back. They start opening up and they realize, <clears throat> you know, we're, we have the same background. Whether it's a, you know, I'm former military, I also even see it in veterans. They'll come in and they'll say, oh my gosh, you're a military guy, or you're a former military guy, let's talk like, you know, we were back from, you know, back at work. And, you know, if a, if, if a black patient comes in and they start, you know, being very um, sheepish, if you will, about their, their problem, then again, I can pick up on that and either see if they really need to be more comfortable or, or make a quick little joke or just make them very calm and then the floodgates open. And then my brother has this, my sister, my, my auntie had this, or you know, my grandmother had a colostomy and nobody knew it until she died and we saw the bag and it's like, holy cow, okay. And then you know, it just starts opening up. And again, you pick up on these little subtleties right away as you do this more and more and it's easy to then navigate that kind of uneasiness. You see these young folks like Chadwick Bozeman, and it's like, well, he had these problems, but he was hiding it because he was a big movie star, and big movie stars don't, wa they wanna have their, you know, they wanna be famous, and they're famous people, and so that's something, that's why he was hiding it, you know? And so it, it's, and when you're young, having these problems, that's quite embarrassing, right? So. You know, um, in the black community, prostate cancer, as was mentioned, is, is very high, but usually that's an older gentleman kind of problem, right? So, you know, all the people will say, oh, that's just an old guy, that's fine, right? But when you have a young person, a young black man who has colon cancer, that's mind blowing. But again, if we talk about it more and it gets out there and you see it on the social media and you see it pushed like it's okay to talk about, you know, the constipation or the blood in your stool and this young guy's talking about it, then it, it becomes, more, you know, much easier to talk about. I also think part of the comfort level, like, like Dr. Avery was talking about, is in the literature, in what you see when you go into a healthcare clinic. You go to a breast center, everything's pink, and there's, you know, a poster of a 75-year-old white woman. That's not the face of cancer anymore. So we really need to make things that we're providing to patients, the areas we're providing, more inclusive so people feel comfortable. And that goes you know, for different uh, different cultures, backgrounds, it goes for the LGBTQ community. We just, we need to be more diverse with all our materials and, and areas that we provide. Charlie, I wanna stay with you for a second. Um, and, and as we're kind of touching upon um, fear, um, COVID-19, the way the pandemic um, has impacted um, everything, right? Everything. I mean, Verlene, one of, one of the folks here, we were just talking about, you know, coming to church and, you know, getting, you know, your temperature checked before you, you know, step into the, the house of the Lord and all of these things, right? Like, it has impacted the way in which um, we all operate in our daily lives and certainly has impacted um, uh, cancer. Um, and, and specifically cancer screening. Um, I wanna talk to you about that, the, the fear uh, of not only COVID-19's uh, impact, but just the general fear around uh, cancer screening. And then I will open it to, to you all because I think it hits right every, every aspect um, when it comes to uh, the cancer continuum. Well there, you know, when we're talking about fear, there are some stigmas we have to get through. I mean, I'm, I don't know if anybody's heard the you name it, you claim it phrase. That, that has to, we have to break those down too and, and make people comfortable with talking about it, don't, not be so fearful. And that's why social workers, navigators are there outside the office to be there to support people um, 
when they're scared, when they're even scared to go get just a mammogram, no diagnosis, but just to get a mammogram, letting them know, you know, educating them on screening and prevention. Um, I also think, with, you know, with COVID-19, they have very sh short studies. They haven't, they don't have long-term studies yet, but I know in 2020, we saw a decrease in screening mammograms across the country, anywhere from 25 to 80 percent. So at this point, we are definitely seeing uh, breast cancers diagnosed at later stages. And that, that's really crucial that we, we make people comfortable enough to talk about it, to reach out to somebody so that they get screening on time. We, we can't have this lag like we had. I mean, this just proves, proves how important screening is. So I think, again, just the comfort and the explanation, the education, um, so people aren't scared of what they don't know. Uh, my mother-in-law just got her mammogram. She missed all of last year. She, she missed her last year, and she's a cancer survivor, right? And so it's this feeling of, like, you know where I work, right? I'm like, you're going to make me look bad. I'm like, you need to go get your mammogram. But it's even that, like, the, the folks around us that we have to um, continue to educate and, and keep pushing, um, even though they have all the tools and the resources around them, uh, to, to still break down that, that kind of wall of fear. Something I want to mention with regards to COVID-19, there's been a large backlog of, of screening modalities, whether that be mammograms or colonoscopies or um, things like that. And what patients really need to do is when their screenings come up and they're told, well, you know, there's a backlog, you got to wait, you got to wait. That's when the patient's got to say, I can't wait. You got to help me. I need to look and find another way. There's got to be another way. For example, I do colonoscopies. I do screening colonoscopies. But everybody knows that the GI doctors do colonoscopies. So everybody goes to them. Well, they got all the backlog. And so there are resources out there for patients when they're told no. And they're going to be told no more often now because of COVID-19 and everything that, that happened because of that, just because of just logistics. But there are always ways, and I think when, you know, since this is, you know, we're talking about minorities, when we're told no, then it's like, okay, well, it's all, we've always been told no, so just whatever, let it be. And that's not right. But, uh, but subtle point that happens to be, I think, the crux of a lot of the issue with screening is, um, Persistence, uh, often in, in, in brown and, and black folks, isn't uh, isn't as high, maybe as as um, uh, as other communities, and that oftentimes can can lead to just, especially in a low resource uh, healthcare system like we we have in El Paso that may not maybe short GI doctors. If you just hear no once and you quit, uh, I see so many patients unfortunately where that happens where you know they can. You know, they put in that first initial effort, and then they run into all the problems with the healthcare system, and then they kind of just quit. They kind of just stop. Um, whereas there's patients who they get hit with that, and uh, and you know they they push through that. And I wish I, I could see more folks in the black community, uh, more folks from the uh, more under-resourced brown community, uh, push through those barriers and. Uh, and, and, you know, say, no, you know, this is something that there must be a way because I see all these other folks getting it done. So how come I can't get it done within three months when I know somebody I work with that got it done in three months? What did they do? Who do they know? Right? And then pushing through and not just taking no for an answer. That's, that's very important. Um, to that point, I think there's also, um, you know, as an administrator, right, I'm the non-clinician up on the stage, there's accountability on the hospital and the healthcare system to be more equitable, right? To create an environment where we're not enabling that inequity to happen, where so much is on our patients to self-advocate, where it's not going to happen for them unless they they manifest it right they they make it happen for themselves um and i mean that's my job not not y'all y'all do the they're the miracle workers up here i'm the suit um i'm not, but but it, it you know 
hearing what you're saying, it, it, it not necessarily dawns on me, but it reminds me of the, the work as an administrator, what needs to be done to create the environment and the system that would enable patients to not have to do that. Yeah. Um, going back to uh, quickly the screening, uh, and we, we alluded to this a little bit uh, around clinical research. Um, oftentimes we're looking at screening guidelines and there's some examinations um, whether current guidelines may perpetuate disparities uh, by not accounting for differences in age onset, um, severity, risk of certain cancers um, across groups. Um, so I'd love to hear your, your perspectives on whether you think new approaches to cancer screening guidelines could you know, address some of these, these issues. There's, a, there's an interesting question because we, we have a, um, a federal task force, the US PPSF, US Preventative Task Force, that is basically in charge of coming up with some kind of standardized guideline that we can apply to all of Americans. But we just talked about one of the big issues with that, and that's those guidelines are based off of studies that may not have examined uh, the African American community uh, and included those in there. So what you end up with is a general screening guideline for breast cancer for all women when we know that African American women are more likely to develop aggressive disease and to develop aggressive disease earlier. But we still have the same, we still teach every doctor the same thing. Um, and unless you kind of teach yourself and, 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 and uh, are passionate enough, then your, your doctor themselves may not necessarily know that because they're just looking at the guideline. Um, and so um, self-advocacy plays a part in that too to make up for that gap. Um, but there, there's definitely um, you know, room to go um, in those things. And, and Dr. Walker can talk a little bit more in terms of uh, colonoscopy screening. But when it comes to you know, prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, the just, just going to your doctor and expecting them to necessarily uh, uh, know that you have uh, family history or that you may be at higher risk as an African American, um, I don't think is the best way to go. And until, until Franz, hopefully, you know, we can establish more and more systems and more folks like Franz can, can take that burden off of you. Um, you know, we can't be naive and say, well, help's on the way. You know, until then, you kind of have to help yourself. You know, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the reality of the situation, right? So, you know, spreading that word and, and uh, being more, uh, you know, having those discussions with your physician um, and, and expressing your concerns, I think, is, is one way to fix that in the short term. Yeah, I think the, the, the screening issues um, do come down to, though, um, a lot to access, right? So if, if you don't even have access to a primary care doctor because either you don't have insurance for it or um, you're, you have some other reason not to see a primary care doctor, you can't get these screenings. Um, and whether there's a genetic basis or not, um, I think you first got to be, you first have to talk to somebody about it. And whether that be your neighbor or, you know, your doctor, you got to have a doctor to then get you to the, to the next level screen. And that's where minorities have the problem. Um, and so I, again, I do a lot of self promoting and trying to get patients in to get these, these screenings. Um, we've dropped the screening age. Um, not necessarily because of access, it, has, it helps with access, but we've dropped the screening aging, um, age because we've started to see colon cancer in younger folks. We still don't know why, and that's where the research would help if it you know, could help find more reasons as to why people are having younger, younger people are finding colon cancer. But we, the other issue is, is because it just got changed last year, now insurances are covering it. We knew that we were, a couple of years before, we knew we started seeing younger folks with colon cancer and we needed to get there, but we couldn't get even insurance to cover it because the guidelines didn't say it. But now that we have the guidelines, we can push it. And we, we don't know why though, people are still seeing younger folks um, to this day. And there are some guidelines out there that say in minority patients, they should be done at 40. And sometimes you can convince the insurance companies to, to have that younger age even because they're minorities, but even that's, tricky, right? There's a lot of things we have to play with when it comes to 
insurances and things like that. But again, it's access, I think, is what it starts with. And then getting the word out to the providers that just follow the guidelines. Well, if you have a minority patient and they're, you know, 40 years old, well, they're just going to say, well, you're not 45 yet, sorry. Right. Well, you got to understand that this may be the first time and only time they're seeing you, and this is when you can get them. So let's figure out a way to get them screened, you know, earlier. So there's a lot of issues there. I'm hearing access as, as certainly a, a barrier. Um, we've heard the, the healthcare system as complex and, and convoluted as it is trying to navigate your way through it. Um, what are some of the, the others, and, and certainly Charlie as a, uh, a navigator, right? You're, you're the, the GPS for our patients, helping them get through that, that complex um, healthcare system. Um, what are some of the other barriers you're seeing uh, for our community to get the, the care that they so need and that they deserve? Um, well, along with that, I also think education sometimes is, sometimes is a barrier as far as getting education out to different communities. Because uh, when we're talking about screening, there are different screening guidelines if you have someone in your family who is diagnosed with an early cancer. If you have family history, um, that you might have a different screening uh, guideline. So I think getting that out, not having access to that kind of uh, information is huge. Um, we also talk, you know, and here locally, um, people forget to talk about the way um, people are brought up as a child, where they live as a child. You know, your, your health sometimes is, a lot of it's determined on the factors that are around you in your area, in your environment as a child. So if, if, you're, if there's something that you're not getting, you know, access to care to something and you're getting ill or you're getting these things that other demographics might not be getting, that could affect you later in life, whether it's a cancer or diabetes, something like that. So I think um, we also need to pay attention to that. We need to just not ask what was your history here. We need to find out what, what it was as a child and you know, if that puts you at any additional risk for anything. The family history piece is so interesting because it almost makes me sit and think like, have I ever asked my mother, like, tell me everyone who's had cancer in our family. Right, I, I know I, I've lost my eldest sister who passed away at the age of 40 from triple negative breast cancer. And that's the only person that I know, right? Because I witnessed it. That's the only person that I know um, in my family. Everyone else, it might be like, oh, your uncle had this other thing or you know, prior to, to me being alive, it might have been some other illness that that's what they think it was um, because folks go untreated. Um, so it's really interesting if anyone has ever sat down to ask in the same way we, we ask a genealogy of, a, oh, tell me the family tree. Like, have we ever done that from a almost a disease perspective to give us a sense of um, what are we most at risk for? I think that might be somewhat difficult in terms of the family history in the minority community, right? I mean, we all know that there are issues with, you know, um, uh, families that are not all full families, right? We're missing certain individuals, and then we don't know. We don't know what the family history is of that, that individual in the family, and so then that becomes a problem and you don't know. So again, it comes to the access where, okay, let me ask you about your family history. At least you're in the office. I don't know my family history. Maybe. Um, that would push you to say, okay, well, that we, we need to get you screened then because that's an aspect of your family you don't know. We need to get you. So, again, I think it comes down to the providers knowing the questions to ask and then the patients knowing to actually or trying to get the patients in the, okay. in the door. So how important is genetic testing then to when it comes to to, to cancer when it comes to cancer screening if if certainly if you you don't have a sense of your your family history and whether you do or, or you don't um, how important and, and anyone can answer this um, how important is is getting right right genetic testing um, I can speak on colon cancer um, and rectal cancer um, we know that about 
15% of colon cancer is related to genetics. The rest is bad luck. And unfortunately, there's probably more genetics that we just don't know about. And so when it comes, if patients were to come to me and say, can I get genetic tested? Well, again, that's like I just said, 85% of cancers are bad luck. So we have to do the screenings. Now, if they did come to me and said, hey, I have a family member that had colon cancer at age 50, or they were 45 and they had colon cancer, that triggers my brain to say, no, nah, there might be a genetic thing here because that's very young to get a colon cancer. And so, yes, then I will hit you with the genetic testing. Um, but just blanket genetic testing for a colon cancer thing is not necessarily the best route. Um, and I tell patients that because they will come to me and ask that. But young, and the young folks that come to me with colon cancer are all just going to get tested for that 15%, because if, that's, if they're genetically susceptible to colon cancer, then their whole family is susceptible. And so then that starts the train down that road. The, <coughs> the, um, the first step though, so what Dr. Walker mentioned about uh, you know, having that discussion, right? you have to show up to have that discussion, right? You have to establish care. You have to, you know, ha there are certain instances when it comes to breast and prostate cancer where you can ask for uh, either early screening or genetic testing, but um, you have to be in front of a doctor to do that. And you have to be in front of a doctor who, who knows what they're talking about and can have that discussion with you and make the best decision with you. Um, but that, that requires, you know, making sure to, to establish care. And we, we, we actually know from the data that, that uh, African Americans and, and minorities in general are uh, and especially so for African Americans, are you know about half as likely to routinely catch, uh, uh, even per USPTF the general guidelines, um, half as likely to to catch those routine screenings annually and consistently. Um, and I you know you could we could talk about uh, you know the, the issues that factor into that, but I, I do want to say that uh, the the government realizes that it's actually a lot cheaper to catch the cancer. So there's actually a vested interest to, in, in catching that cancer rather than treating it down the road because that's much more expensive. So that means that Medicare, that means that it's by law, every insurance, no matter what insurance you have, how good, how bad, it has to be covered. It has to be covered and it has to be covered pretty much fully. Okay, you may have like a small, you know, $10, $20 copay, but beyond that, there's, it's, it's very clear to everybody involved, all the decision makers, that you know this is the way to go. Is we need people to 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 get the screenings they need to keep the advanced cancers from happening and to, to, to come in with small problems rather than big problems. So I want to reiterate that message uh, in terms of establishing care. It's a very good point. And if you think about it, kind of more basically, if you can find a problem for a hundred bucks versus. $30,000 with all of that involved and all the treatments and all the times in the hospital and the complications that come with that, the government's going to say, I'm, I'm going to spend that $100, <laughs> you know? So that's why it's just low cost. Watching people, but you don't want to see them. <laughs> I don't want you to see any of the people up here. I also want to add, uh, Dr. Avery touched on it. We, we only have seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to genetics. So we know about 47, 50 genes that link breast cancer, and that's why it's important to get as much history as you can. You know it might be difficult sometimes, but try your best because that could make a difference on whether you qualify for genetic testing, um, whether you screen earlier. Um, with black women getting triple negative cancer more often than other populations, that's an automatic um, flag for genetic testing because it's more frequently genetically linked. So as much history as we can find out, again, talking, getting, getting the subject out there and, and talking to family, and as much as we can get, the better. And I know that's going to change as generation, you know, I think it's changing. But, and I know we still don't know some stuff about our grandparents, even our parents, because in the black and the brown community, as women, I know we're always taking care of the family first. And then if something's wrong with us, maybe we'll address it or maybe we won't, right? So, so it's very important, you know, that we, we just take care of ourselves and educate ourselves on, on what we can do to prevent an early, an early detection. 
um, I'm conscious of the time. We have just about 15 minutes. I want to make sure we open up the floor and, and the microphone to uh, the, the folks who are here, if there are any um, questions from, the, from our folks in the room. And don't be shy. Please, there's a microphone right here in the middle. So uh, triple negative breast cancer, the reason it's called triple negative is because there's three markers that we usually check for whenever somebody has breast cancer. Two of them are basically uh, hormone receptors, as in receptors that, you know, we, you may have heard of estrogen, which is the female sex hormone that all women produce that actually causes them to develop breasts, right? So breast tissue naturally has uh, a receptor that can receive that hormone and it responds to it. So um, that's, that's what bre breast, natural breast tissue has. It would be, it would have two of those markers would be positive. Um, and then the third marker is, is called HER2. It ha it's a certain uh, marker that can indicate that this is a special kind of cancer that can be treated with a drug that it responds really well to. That's called HER2. So ERPR are the two hormone uh, receptors. Uh, ER stands for estrogen receptor, uh, PR stands for progesterone receptor, and then HER2 is that special uh, receptor that if it's there, you can use a drug that works really well. So if you're triple negative, it means that you've lost, you know, that cancer is so messed up that it's lost the normal appearance of breast tissue to where it doesn't respond to, to those hormones like it should, like normal breast tissue. And then it also doesn't have that special target that would respond really well to, to kind of like a miracle drug. Um, and so if you're triple negative, it's, you can see how that's bad, right? So that's, that's, what she's, that's what she's referring to. I was asked that question on my boards. I had a patient that said, they said, she's triple negative. And at the time, I knew that answer, which was awesome. <laughs> but I said, that's bad. That's really bad for her. And we need to get her treated with these <laughs> steps. And that's how I answered the question. I'm a doctor, so I passed. So, <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's bad if you're triple negative. That's not not good. Um, but we can treat that. My name is Earl Payton, and I'm uh, one of the local pastors here in the city. And I just want to make a comment, and I really appreciate the discussion. Um, Long overdue. Um, in 2009, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and I was, I'd been out the Army about five or six years, and in the Army, we had a prostate exams once a year when you reach a certain age, and um, I was shocked. That was the initial part was the shock, because no one in my family that I knew of had men had prostate cancer. And so some of your discussion uh, sparked some things in me. Uh, one, I thought the best doctor for prostate cancer was going to be a man, and I discovered a woman, a urologist, oncologist out in California. So I had to get past that stereotype because I was looking for men, and I didn't know women dealt with, had urologists doing things for them. And so that helped me a lot. And... Um, the, uh, I had decided to have the surgery, the prostatectomy, and um, I was pastoring a church, a newly formed church, and I had lots of men there. And what I discovered when I got through all of that was that I had a closed-door meeting with the men, no holes barred, where I talked to them about what happened in the whole process. process. What I found out was the men, especially the, the brothers, the black men, had a problem with someone putting a glove on, and and we had to get past that. Like, has to, yes, it, that's still the best way for them to find out. If you have prostate cancer, you've got to, the doctor has to touch it. All right, so for, and it's probably true of uh, the Latino men too, the, because of the macho masculinity, that the whole idea that uh, you have to go through that process and so I, to, I talked to the guys about how serious it was, and um, only to discover a bunch of them had not had prostate exams, but they were, 
They felt free once I talked about it. I guess that's what I'm saying. They felt free uh, to talk about it and then go get a prostate exam. Okay, so, uh, so thank you for the information that you brought here. Uh, maybe you could comment on, uh, recently I've heard that black men are susceptible to what they call blood cancers. And I'm not sure what that means, but I have some friends who had, is it multiple myeloma? And uh, some of the other skin cancers that we think we can't get. And so uh, uh, probably, uh, Pastor White, we need to get uh, our churches to talk about some of the elephants in the room. And then uh, just recently, I've been retired a long time, um, but uh, recently discovered the list of um, burn pit that I've had two of the things that, because I've deployed to Iraq and, and several years later these things came up. And um, so there needs to be discussion about that because some things we just don't talk about until uh, ha it happens. And my, my wife of almost 40 years now, her niece, her cousin, her, 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 she's 20, close to 30, and they just recently discovered she has to have a double mastectomy. And so that was a shock for our family. And then we did start having a discussion on my wife's side. How many of y'all, how many people have had cancer? And as it turns out, there's several women who have had cancer in their family. So we're starting that discussion so that the next generation can talk about it. But I think uh, having these forums and the willingness of not just this particular month, but that we probably need to talk more about it and more soldiers will find out that they have cancers related to a 20-year war. That, um, and we need to have the discussion um, about that. And like I said, but I wanna thank you all. I didn't have a question, just make a comment, but if you could talk about what they mean by blood cancers, what that means, uh, I think we, it would be helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that, that prostate cancer story. You know, you may have helped some of the men in this room with that. Um, that, is, that is something that you, you're absolutely right. It's something that has to be taken into account, especially sensitive uh, uh, cancers. And this goes for GYN cancers too for women. Um, you know, there's, especially with that mistrust that Charlie alluded to earlier, that, 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 is, that is a potential barrier as well. One thing I wanna mention there that you just reminded me of that I think it's important for you guys to know with your story of your prostate cancer is, you mentioned you seeing a urologist, right, and, and getting the prostatectomy. In, in today's cancer treatment era, everything, every kind of cancer, there isn't a cancer that is not what's called multidisciplinary in its approach. As in, you should probably be seeing a surgeon, you should probably be seeing a, 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 a medical oncologist that's a chemo doctor, and you may be seeing a radiation doctor like me, right? And you should be seeing each of those because they have different viewpoints, they have different approaches, and you should be making sure that they're talking to each other, right? Because that's what we know gives the best chance of survival. And that's established, this isn't even an opinion. So we have studies that show when that happens, you're more likely to survive. Um, but to address your, 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 your question uh, about blood cancers, um, that is, that is primarily true um, of multiple myeloma, as you have mentioned. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, multiple myeloma is a, is, a, is a cancer of the bone marrow, um, and it is, it is more common in, in African-American uh, men, uh, but also in, in women slightly more so uh, than, than other uh, races. Um, there is unfortunately not much you can do to adjust that risk aside from continue to go or to, to go to your doctor annually because how it's usually caught is on the routine blood work that your doctor would be ordering. They may see a problem with your kidneys early on. They may see a problem with your red blood cells um, and they, they would typically catch that at, at, at annual screenings. 
the, the burn pit issue, I'm, I'm actually curious to hear Dr. Walker's um, uh, uh, you know, um, viewpoint on that uh, because that is a whole other uh, right. can of worms and it really is, right? And we all know the running joke that the VA will take anything and say it's not, your, it's not service related, right? Um, but I, I've seen at this point uh, an awful lot of people um, that were exposed to burn pits so far, the, the, the rhetoric and the narrative is still, it's a coincidence. But I, I have a good feeling that's going to change probably pretty soon here. Once you have, you know, decades of that, then folks will go back, look, and say there was definitely something there. But if, if you know somebody who, who was deployed, who was around burn pits, who is having, you know, symptoms that border on, you know, this probably isn't normal. You know that person should be should be getting checked out. Yeah, I want to really emphasize the common theme here, and I think that's access, right? So whether it's burn pit, whether it's minority care, whether it's not, you got to get to a doctor first to bring up these issues. Um, in terms of the burn pit thing, I as well um, was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and was near those things, and if something were to pop up in my health, then I would bring that up to my physician to say, I'm feeling this way, can you take care of me? Not, I was by a burn pit, you gotta do this because I'm at the burn pit. It's, it, it might be related, it might not. Um, when we hear things like, it's more common in black men or black women, I get a little hesitant to say that because I feel like it could also very well be more likely to related to access. Again, minorities aren't able to get to doctors. If they can't get to doctors, then they can't get treated early enough to prevent those problems, and those problems are there, so they're more likely to be found. So it all stems back to getting to see your doctor. Um, and we may, over time, in the research, find that, yes, it, there's a racial thing related to your health, um, but I also think that it's much easier to just treat what's in front of me right away, if it's in front of me, but it's gotta be in front of me first. And then I can go down the, the route of, this is more common in black folks. Um, and I, I do think there is genetic components to diseases that are also racially based as well. But I don't want also to get into that, um, that little box of, oh, you're a black man and you need prostate cancer. Like, no, I, you're, you're a human who is, you know, has a problem and I'm gonna fix you. Um, but you gotta see me first. Um, and so in, in terms of the blood cancers, again, if you're having a problem, you gotta see a doctor to draw that blood test. Um, and if you have that access, you'll, you'll find that. Um, so it, it, I just want, let's not forget there's, a, there's an important thing we kind of glossed over. Uh, it, that's not, this is not the purpose of the discussion per se, but if you notice, Fran said, that cancer was the second leading cause of death, right? So let's not forget that there's still a big killer in the room, the biggest killer, that has exactly to do with what he's talking about. So the takeaway actually uh, that, that, you know, I agree with Dr. Walker, I think the takeaway from this discussion, it shouldn't be so much that, oh, I'm a black man, I'm, I'm more likely to get prostate cancer. It's I'm a black man and I'm less likely to go to the doctor every year. Right, mm -hmm. that's actually probably where the majority of the disparity when it comes to cancer care comes from, is because you're less likely to show up, have that discussion, get the screening, more likely to present advanced, um, and, and, and then access to care could be an issue as well. So, excellent point. Um, first, I wanna say, I'm glad you're here, Pastor, that you're here with us today and, and through your cancer journey. Um, and then I just wanna thank you all for coming here this evening and, and spending this last hour with us. Um, I think we, we touched on a lot of things, but uh, talk to each other, uh, talk to your families, uh, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Um, if something doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. Um, go see a physician um, and we're all up here for a reason. Um, we're, we're available, you know, Dr. Walker here has talked, uh, spoken about access a lot and we um, try to make ourselves as accessible as possible. 
So we are here in the community to be a part of the community. Um, and so you see our faces and hopefully you now know who you can go to uh, when you're feeling like either you or a loved one, um, there's an issue in your, your family or your home, uh, there's, there's a place you can, you can reach out to. And I just wanna, wanna thank you all for spending this uh, time with us. Thank you. I don't know if the panel have uh, time for just one more question. Uh, Reverend Johnson, I, I heard you whispering. <laughs> you had a question that you want to ask, oh, <laughs> if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah, Come on, ask it. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, the fibroids. Yeah, good, good question. So that factors into the screening, and and whether your 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 doctor, when they order the screening, is going to be aware of that, because what that what that means is when you when you do a mammogram, right, you're taking an X-ray and you're trying to find spots that look like cancer versus normal. Now, if you have dense fibrous breast tissue, which African American women more often have then it can be tricky to just look at a mammogram and say, oh, it looks clear because everything kind of looks fibrous, right? Everything looks like kind of like those fibroids you were talking about, which can be hard to tell apart. And so in that situation, I would add on an MRI. So if I get a young black woman who's coming to the clinic and I may start with a mammogram and that mammogram comes back as dense tissue, I don't take that as, okay, there's no cancer, right? I would, I would add on a breast MRI for that exact reason. But yes, the, the, it has more to do with the screening, less so with uh, developing uh, more aggressive um, cancer, as far as we understand it right now. All right. Thank you all so much. Come on, can you give our, our panel a hand clap? <laughs> Amen. I want to make sure there's no more questions. I don't want to rush. Make sure everybody have their questions answered. We're good. All right. Okay, come on. It's, it's, this is becoming the theme of the talk. Uh, go to your doctor. Uh, so you probably know, and I'm actually, I, I mean, I understand, I'm kind of guilty of this too, right? So, you know, I'm, I, I sh probably should be going to the doctor every year, but, you know, whether it's, you know, you feel busy, you know, maybe it's like, ah, do I, re I feel fine, do I need to go pay 30 bucks for somebody to, you know, potentially put a glove somewhere where I don't want it, right? But, but that's, that's, that's part of the deal. That's, <laughs> so... Don't worry, nobody, nobody's doing prostate exams if you're 30, or at least they shouldn't be. Um, my, my, I'm, yes, yeah, yeah. it's going to happen. My <laughs> if you get to me, yeah, that's what happens. If, if you end up in his office, you might have taken a wrong turn somewhere. But um, so, so what, what you can do as a young person primarily is, is make sure to go to the doctor regularly. You know, uh, and again, preventative services, again, are covered. It should be either completely covered or just a very small copay. And then the other thing you can do is talk to your parents, right? What are, what are your, 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 you know, your parents, your aunts, your uncles? Um, you know, the more of this message that you heard tonight that you can get out to the community, you know, you may potentially save a life. I know we, we kind of say that, it sounds cliche, but it's true, it's true, right? If you go out right now and you talk to 10 people you know that, that, fit, that may benefit from screening, right? Most of the screening guidelines are on the order of if you, if you screen 100 people, you'll save a life. So 10 of you go out tonight, talk to 10 people, that's a life saved, right? And, and, you know, we're in a church right now. I don't have to tell you how much that means. 
uh, to, to the big man upstairs, right? So this is, this is something that as a young person that I don't want you to discount uh, that you can do, right? So. And in terms of young people, what they need to also watch out for are symptoms, right? And they need to know the symptoms. So first, that's a senior doctor. Um, but when t in, in terms of colon problems, it's constipation, bleeding, bloating, abdominal pain um, that are not getting better or that are unusual for you. That's what I tell young patients. Chad McBoseman probably had abdominal pain for five years before he found out that he had colon cancer, honest, honestly. Um, and he probably just didn't tell anybody because he's the, you know, like I said, strapping young man, belly pain, whatever. And he goes, works out, has some belly pain. That's just what it is. Probably had some blood in his stool. Don't want to talk about that. And you got to be comfortable talking about these symptoms. But it's symptoms that the young folks need to not ignore, okay? Um, what else can young people do? You can eat better. You can lay off the meat. Maybe once a month, kind of meeting with plant-based diets. We know that we, we're leaning towards dietary causes of these colon cancers. Um, stay away from the smoking. Stay away from the excessive drinking, that kind of stuff. So those are the things that young folks can do to start thinking about, you know, what to look out for when it comes to these cancers. And it's not just colon cancer. That's everything. That's lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, all the big bad cancers. They're all, you know, they all come with symptoms that if they start to show up, you got to tell somebody so that the workup can be done. So I, I just want to add on breast cancer because that's another one that if you're under that age and you go to the doctor, if you don't mention those symptoms, right? So if you notice a lump, you notice some redness, you notice some swelling, definitely bring it up to the doctor. But yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. It's okay. I take pictures. I take pictures. You should see my phone. <laughs> Patients think I love it too. They send me pictures all the time. And I'm like, okay, okay. But it's okay. And I don't discourage it. I just don't really look. It's funny because I'll do, a, I'll do an operation and they'll take a, they'll have a, they'll go to the bathroom and then they'll take pictures of themselves. And I walk into the room and they will often say, I have pictures of it. And I'm saying, I believe you. That's all I need. I believe you. Because people don't make that up, right? They're not going to make it up. So it's okay. I get it. It's okay. That's a walk by faith, not by sight. Yes. I don't need to see it. I believe you. I know there's some more questions back there. Go ahead. Bob Marley died of skin cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm taking out a couple of hemorrhoids that have come back as melanomas in the bottom mm -hmm. where the sun literally does not shine. Mm -hmm. So that's where they saw their primary doctor. They were having some bleeding. And sure enough, they thought it was just hemorrhoids, mm -hmm. never just hemorrhoids, and then the melanoma. So again, it's symptoms for the young folks that they see. I've taken care of probably five young folks in the last month with colon cancer. That's less than 45. So these folks showed up with these symptoms and would not have gotten screened last year just because they're way under 50, and they would not have gotten screened this year even at 45. Right. So, you know, it's symptoms. They gotta, you got to tell somebody. And, and certainly when it comes to, to, like, skin cancer, right, this is the Sun City, right? you got to wear sunscreen, sunblock, 
um, when you see a, a mole that you didn't see before, it looks irregular, right? You got to go get it checked out. Like, you know when something is awry. You walk in your house, you're like, well, that wasn't there before. You know when somebody touched something. So if you look on your body and you see that something has been moved, something is there that, has it, that wasn't there before, um, that's when you need to go get it checked out. There's a question back there. talking about this and as we talk about young people, um, I had some other family members that found out that they had, uh, had one cousin who was suffering or had uh, breast cancer. Now, there, there are those that decide not to have treatment. Mm -hmm. And when they get into these, uh, what is it called? get that quite often and it's heartbreaking as a physician and a science mind that I have when it comes to that kind of thing but I also respect it right because that's their choice they have they've gotten to me which just means they did everything we said to do and they just want to hear what my opinion is and if they have decided not to I'll be here when they come back and I let them know and that's okay it's sad but you know that's their choice, and that's what we we have that here, you know, in this country. So, that's that's okay for me. It's okay. I I will say that that um, here, especially, I run into it more than anywhere else. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, with with Mexican culture. Obviously, there's a lot of Mexican influence here. There's a focus on yerbas, focus on things like that. But, um, you know. I feel like I've been able to at least overcome a lot of that um, misunderstanding, which is what it tends to be, and I think not um, uh, so, some level of uh, ignorance as to what I'm trying to say, right, and what medicine is, what, what exactly is chemotherapy, what is it doing, is it a poison, that kind of stuff. Um, the, the, the few times that, that, thankfully I haven't run into it as much in the black community, the few times I have run into it, I feel like it's come from more of the mistrust uh, background and also you know requires a discussion and taking the time um, and a lot of the times as you guys know when you go to doctors and they're very busy they're not necessarily going to take that time um, but I think that that's one way that that you know you can break down that potential barrier is to take the time to sit down uh, and have that discussion and say w what is your why are you hesitant to take actual medical treatment, what what are your misconceptions? That, what did you hear? What experiences might you have that are that are making you? And oftentimes, even just if there is mistrust, just by taking the time and, and showing them that, that that you care, you're not just going to let it go at face value. You can break down some of that mistrust too. So, the the great philosopher Jay Z once said, um, you you can't you can't heal what you never reveal. And, and for me, I think it's being able to call it out and say, like, I, you know, there is mistrust. And, and it's validated, validating what people feel about, you know, the medicine and about health care and, and you understanding that you are part of that and why they might mistrust you and then still pushing through. Um, I think that that means a lot um, to, to patients.
I think you should take that money you spent on the probiotics and go buy some Metamucil or some green spinach or something else. I think uh, probiotics are a waste of money and um, it's not going to help you. <laughs> well, you can come to my office and talk more. <laughs> He's going to get that glove ready, brother. You better, better watch out. Come on one more time. Help me thank God for our panel. Thank you all. Uh, listen, I hope uh, uh, I got a message from our fax uh, servant leader, and she is hoping that you all will be willing to come back and share up for a follow-up so that we can ha continue to have this discussion, as was mentioned before tonight by Pastor Payton. We don't just have it tonight, but we continue to have it uh, because it's so important. It's so important, uh, and, and especially in our community. And I want to thank each of you. Uh, for uh, lending your time out of this day for sharing with us on tonight. Uh, thank you, Brother F uh, Franz, for uh, connecting with us uh, and on, even on tonight. And I want to give a special shout out again to Sister Verlene Steptoe for connecting us. <laughs> Amen. Connecting us uh, even on tonight. Uh, and I want us to continue to have this conversation uh, as we continue to learn more and even develop more knowledge and help other people know uh, what we've been learned uh, even on tonight. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again. Uh, we're getting ready to go, and I want to thank each of you for your presence on tonight. Uh, but I especially want to thank uh, the pastors that have showed up on tonight, Pastor Peyton, Pastor Maxwell. Thank you both for being here on tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you both uh, for being here, and uh, it is my prayer that uh, as we continue to have these forums, that your people will continue to come on out uh, and share with us in these discussions and in this event uh, to be educated about uh, and have conversation on, on cancer. Uh, just a quick announcement, uh, since I got Shiloh here, please don't forget Shiloh, uh, that morning worship is at 11 a.m. We'll be back here Sunday morning, uh, 925 Sunday School, worship is at 11 uh, a.m., uh, and then Women's Weekend is coming up, and we're excited for that, and I hope that you are, too, next week. Uh, and so we're excited about what God has for us. I'm going to pray us out. Uh, I hope you all don't mind if they can come up and approach you all if they have more questions and want to uh, converse more. But they can do that. Let's uh, pray. Actually, pa Pastor Payton, if you don't mind, come on, pray us out, if you will, sir, if you don't mind. How long do you want me to do it? <laughs> Eternal God, we're thankful and grateful tonight for these men and women, these doctors and their scientific minds and how they broke it down for us. And we thank you that we broke down some barriers tonight. We pray for our individual church communities that we can spread what we heard here tonight. God, you are the great physician we believe in your power to heal. And so, God, we pray for healing in this room tonight. Thank you for these healers, these doctors. May you continue to bless them in all that they say, all that they do. Thank you for the Shiloh Church. Thank you for Pastor White and his leadership. Keep us in your care. Surround us with your peace, your presence, your power, and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Have a good night, everyone.